Hey guys, welcome back to DRES on Clownfish TV. This is Neon. I am here with my cohort, Mr. Mike Phelan. Say hello, Mike. Hey. And a very special guest, we have Mr. Bobby Valla from the Valaverse, uh, action figure creator extraordinaire. We're going to talk about Action Force. We're going to talk about independent toys, G.I. Joe, and internet drama. Sound like something you're up for? I mean, it's it's not the toy industry without some drama, right? Hmm. All right, guys. So, yeah, we've been doing a couple, uh, a couple of podcasts talking about toys on this channel. Mike and I are both huge toy collectors, big mm -hmm. toy fans. And I'm assuming Mr. Bobby Valla <laughs> is, is also a, a huge toy collector, toy fan. I dabble a little bit. I dabble a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Bobby, why don't you give our listeners who are maybe not familiar with you uh, just kind of the nickel tour? Tell us about your experience in the toy industry. Uh, tell us about where you've been, what you're working on now and where you hope to go. Sure, sure. Um, I'll try to give uh, the quick version. Uh, it could get long winded sometimes. Um, but I'm Bobby Valla. I am the uh, owner and operator of Valaverse. And my flagship line, Action Force, which hopefully all of you listening know the line and have purchased some. But it is a collector-based six-inch scale military line with all unique characters, gear, all, all sorts of things like that. And I started this company back in 2019. And uh, But before that, I worked for probably the largest toy company in the world. I was at Hasbro for just about seven years working on... The Marvel brand, but I also spent some time working on other brands like G.I. Joe, uh, you know, did some Star Wars items, some Transformers items. But the bulk of my time there was on uh, Marvel and G.I. Joe. So before I get into the, the toy industry, I wanted to draw comic books. So I, you know, after high school, I went to uh, the Joe Kubert Art School. Oh, awesome. That's, that's all I wanted to do was draw comics. I just love comics and I love drawing. And I said, this is, you know, I couldn't play, you know, I couldn't get into a, a, a good college to play college hockey. My grades weren't good. So I said, all right, well, let me, uh, let me use my, my drawing talent and, and do something with that. So, you know, I went there and, you know, I was, I was probably too young to have gone there at the time. Cause I, I didn't put, you know, my best effort forward until after I had graduated and I was, you know, young and naive and cocky and, you know, not a good mix, but it was fun going there. And then, you know, once I got out, I was, you know, doing the con circuit, you know, with my portfolio, trying to talk to editors and stuff and found out really quickly that the comic book industry is very hard to get into. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's very, very hard. And it, I think it, all it, three of us have, uh, have experience with that. Okay. I've, been re I've been rejected. I know Tom's <laughs> done his stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I got in. I actually uh, got into comics when I stopped trying to get into comics. It was a long, long story. <laughs> we'll save that one that's for another day. But, yeah, yeah. I had a, a you know a, a cork board in my my bedroom that had all my rejection letters pinned to it. <laughs> um, you know, and there were a lot of them. But you know, I just kept plugging along. It's like I really wanted to do that. Like. It, you know, it was such a cool thing to do. And I loved the comics industry. And, but, you know, reality set in and I was like, oh, I actually have to get a job. I got to pay student loans and bills and stuff like that. So I went and got a job at a law firm. And I was doing that while trying to do, you know, comic stuff. And I did like small indie stuff uh, on the side, but nothing ever materialized. And a good friend of mine was like, hey, man, why don't you, you know, you love toys, you collect toys. My brother works at Hasbro. Why don't you do like some toy design stuff? And I'd like never thought about it. I'm like, yeah, I love toys. I collect tons of toys. So he got me in touch with his brother who was on the Transformers team at Hasbro at the time. And this was like 2007 during the first movie. Mm. And I sent him some of my work and he was like, all right, cool. Let's get you started on some some stuff. And I started designing some stuff. And then shortly after that. I got invited to a vendor fair at Hasbro, which it was the last time they ever did it. But what they would used to do is they would invite all their, their vendors that did freelance work for them. And they'd come to Hasbro and they'd set up like a table, like a convention. And you try to meet all the other designers at, at Hasbro and show your work and try to get work from them. And through that, I was able to get work from, uh, you know, guy in the Star Wars team. And then I got in with a guy in the G.I. Joe team. So I got to do a bunch of G.I. Joe work during like the 25th anniversary era. And then... I was like, holy crap, like this is this is where I want to work. Like I want to work here. Like I loved it. I walked in there and I immediately knew I wanted to work there. And I was talking to, you know, my friend's brother and he's like, well, you know, 
you should probably go back to school and get your toy design degree. And I'm like, well, I kind of already went to school. Like I'm, I, I got a job. I'm not, I'm not looking to go back to school. And he's like, well, you're not really going to, going to get a job here. And I was like, well, I could probably just do freelance work and, you know, get in the, you know, that way. And mm -hmm. I just, the more <laughs> freelance work I did, the further I felt like I was getting from actually like getting to work there. So I said to myself, all right, I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to be serious about it. I'm going to go back to school. So I had to go back, start four years of college all over again. This time around, I actually got to play Division Three college hockey, which was awesome. And then I went to uh, FIT in New York City, which is one of only two schools in the entire country that give a toy design degree. It's where Hasbro gets a lot of their designers mm -hmm. from. So after, I, you know, right before I, I went to the FIT, I had gotten an internship at Hasbro. And I was on the G.I. Joe team, which was so awesome. And that was like 2010 or 2011, something like that. And I got to work on a bunch of really cool stuff for Pursuit of Cobra and the Renegades line. And I, I loved it. And I was like, it reaffirmed like, this is what I wanted to do. And and I, I made sure that I worked really, really hard to, to get to Hasbro. And then during my FIT time, I did another internship at Hasbro, this time on the Marvel team. And that was amazing. So I had all this toy design experience, like coming out of school. People knew me, you know, they really liked me. I worked really hard. And once I graduated, they didn't have a job opening yet. So I had to take a crappy job at Fisher Price working on Thomas the Tank Engine. And that really sucked. Um, but I was just like, all right, the Hasbro job is going to come. And I interviewed and, and got a job offer from Crayola. And I ended up turning that down, which was a really, really good offer because Hasbro finally called. We have this job for you. Great. Moved my entire life up to Rhode Island. Got an apartment, started fresh and started working at Hasbro. And it was amazing. Um, I was on the exclusives team, which at the time they had a team that was dedicated to the exclusive items for Target, Walmart, Toys R Us, Costco, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now each individual team handles their own exclusives. But so I got to work on G.I. Joe stuff. I got to work on Transformer stuff. I got to work on uh, Star Wars stuff, Nerf, Marvel. So it was really great. I got to touch all these brands right off the bat. And then a bunch of layoffs happened in early 2013. My boss got let go and they they did away with that exclusives team. And then they folded me into the Marvel team like full time. And I took over uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2 when that movie was coming out. I took over that product. And then I was doing the Marvel Universe 4-inch figures, which was awesome. And then from then on, I just worked on a ton of different MCU movies and lines i did a lot of legend stuff i did the 12 inch legends the one-to-one -one prop replica stuff uh, was all mine from the start the vehicles line and then i had a stint on gi joe i was actually the the first person to do the six inch line so i had started the six inch line when they were writing the script for the third movie and we were just about to go to tooling with my six inch gi joe line and they canceled the movie and Hasbro didn't want to do a G.I. Joe line if there was no entertainment attached to it, mm -hmm. which was a bad decision at the time, because we all see that the classified line is very successful mm -hmm. without entertainment. And I was bummed. I was like, man, that's such a mistake. And then I ended up leaving the G.I. Joe team, went back to the Marvel team. And, you know, I just I did my thing. Uh, you know, I worked on the last two Avengers movies. And then there was a giant layoff in 2018, o October of 2018. And I was, I got, you know, lumped into that, that layoff, um, you know, but that's a, another story for another yeah. time. And then I said, well, I'm obviously going to stay in the, you know, in the toy industry. And I said, well, let me, you know, a friend of mine was like, why don't you do your own thing? You, you can pull off a line. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'd rather just work for a company. But at the same time, I was like, you know, it was a mistake for them to cancel the GI Joe line. And mm -hmm. I said, a six inch GI Joe line has a place in, 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 in collecting. Mm -hmm. And there was, at the time, the G.I. Joe team had not they, they hadn't worked on anything. They didn't announce anything. So I said, I'm going to try to get a military line out there before anybody else. And I said, all right, well, you know, I started to, to design my line and the characters and stuff. And, you know, a good friend of mine, you know, I was trying to think of like the name for the line. And he's like, hey, you know, at the time he was when he was let go in the same layoff as, as I did, he was in charge of, you know, uh, re-registering all the, the trademarks for GI Joe. And he would let a lot lapse because they're like, we're never going to use this trademark ever again. Hmm. And one of the ones that, you know, he was like, Hey, you know, you should look into some of these names. They might have some, you know, some, some real estate, you know, with the fans. Uh, 
And, you know, he I, I, I don't remember exactly how it happened. I don't know if he mentioned it or if I brought it up, but Action Force was put on the table mm-hmm. and, you know, Action Force was available. And for those of you who don't know, Action Force was originally developed by Palatoy, which was a, a, a Europe, UK based toy company. And in the in the 80s, they developed uh, five point articulated like Star Wars military action figures. Mm-hmm. And it was huge over there. This came out before G.I. Joe. So they were ahead of G.I. Joe doing their own thing. And it took off for them figures, vehicles. And then uh, a few years later, Hasbro ended up buying out Palatoy. And because G.I. Joe was an American brand and they it couldn't really thrive over in the U.K., they were issuing G.I. Joe's in Action Force packaging, trying to get their figures out. And then eventually it just became G.I. Joe over in the U.K. and they phased Action Force out. And then in 2005, Hasbro stopped, uh, you know, renewing the trademark on Action Force. So it laid dead for decades until I came around and I, and I bought it. <laughs> I bought it and, and I looked at me doing Action Force as a way of just, you know, Re- revamping the brand because I didn't want that brand to to lay dead. You know, no one would have done anything with it had I not come around and got it. And, you know, Bob Breakin, who is the original creator and designer of the Action Force line at Palatoy, he said on many occasions that my Action Force is a continuation of what he did. So it, w- it meant a lot to hear that from the guy who created it, you know, to know that he was happy that I took the ball and I, I, I went and I created something new and, and, and continued with what, you know, an evolution of what he did. Um, so that, that meant a lot to me. And now, you know, it started out as a, a you know, a Kickstarter, a crowd fund. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it funded in November of 2019. And then we unlocked a whole bunch of, of items that started out as, you know, three figures and it turned into a whole ton of items. And then I was all ready, got my factory, we sent them my, my paint masters, my hard copies all ready to go. And then COVID hit and it was yeah, like, crap. Yeah. and then all the, the, you know, the, the factories in China closed down for, you know, eight, 10 months. And that really put a damper on things. But I did a lot while, you know, we had that delay. I put out comics, you know, we signed Sergeant Slaughter. I did a bunch of things to keep the brand relevant instead of just sitting there waiting for the, the toys to get finished. Cause I knew I wanted to build an IP, not just a, a toy line. Like I wanted this to be more than just the figures and it just grew and grew and grew figures finally came out in, I think it was late 2021. Yeah. Late 2021. But then I had had series two, like already in development and tooled up so that as soon as series one came out, I can get series two out just a couple months later and since then, it's like I have not stopped. And I've put out, you know, I think like 87 items, which is a ton of items in that short period of time. And, you know, I'm not I'm not stopping. But the fans seem to really love the line. It's got a great following. And it's like the line just keeps getting bigger every day. Like every day we run our metrics and seeing the new customers that come in on a daily basis is outstanding. So I'm just riding the wave and I'm. I'm just like humbled and amazed that like this thing is working and I'm just like, this is really cool. Um, so yeah, so long winded, but that, that, that was basically, you know, the, the Bobby Valor journey. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, so yeah, you mentioned GI Joe. I thought it was kind of weird that there, there was like a, a blackout on GI Joe at Hasbro for a few years. I remember yeah. after the, the 20th, 25th anniversary mm-hmm. um and after the movies that like if you even went to gi joe.com it just took you to the hasbro site and there was a lot of speculation that hasbro did not want to do anything with gi joe because it was military is that yeah. is that true is it just they didn't want to tie it into the movies or or they didn't have a movie to tie it into i think hasbro looked at it as hasbro was a different or um gi joe was a difficult brand to make worldwide because it was yeah. red white and blue it was very you know and then with the movies you notice uh, they they tried to go away from the red, white, and blue and just do that star with the eagle on it, like made it a, a, a kind of a generic military thing. And, I, you know, you got to lay into what G.I. Joe was. And yet, yeah, I mean, there's enough fans, as we see, that buy G.I. Joe in the U.S., but also we've seen with Classified that G.I. Joe sells worldwide. So, I, you know, Hasbro was different then than it is now. A lot of leadership was different then than it is now. Again, they thought very entertainment based when I was there. So 
they felt like every entertainment had to drive everything. And I was like, guys, this line will sell without entertainment. And, you know, the entertainment they were doing with G.I. Joe just sucked. You know, two movies sucked. The animated series sucked. So it's like the only thing they did that was worth a damn for entertainment was Resolute. They did a one shot movie that was fantastic. Yeah, that was, that but, was good. you know, um, yeah, after after re Retaliation, uh, they made it a Toys R Us exclusive line. Mm -hmm. But the crazy thing is Toys R Us loved it and Toys R Us sold G.I. Joe really well. And I remember when I was on the brand, Toys R Us was like, we want more. And I developed this whole line of stuff we could do with limited tooling to get new fresh items out there. And, you know, we're trying to tell upper management, hey, Toys R Us wants this. Like they, they want it. This is the line we're doing. And they were like, no, we don't want to do it because there's no entertainment. And we were just like, seriously? Now, the other problem is, is that. You have Paramount, who had the you know the rights to the GI Joe movie. Mm -hmm. They're telling Hasbro they want to keep doing a GI Joe movie because it's made money. It's it's proven that it makes money. It didn't make a ton of money, but the first movie made money. The second movie made money, not like billions, but enough to turn a profit. And Hasbro didn't want to do GI Joe. Hasbro wanted to do Mask. Hasbro wanted to push their Hasbro universe, but they wanted to focus on Mask. And Paramount's like. No one knows what mask is. We don't know what mask is. No one knows what mask is. We want to do GI Joe. It's proven. So you have the company that owns the brand saying, we don't want you to do the brand. And then you have the movie studio who has license saying, no, we want to do that movie. So it's there. It, it's conflicting. So it's like there was no love for GI Joe then. So it's, it's nice to see a changing of the guard and see that it finally came out and that GI Joe has love again. Because, like, G.I. Joe is my all-time favorite brand. I have a 300-square-foot house, a room in my house that's called the Joe Room. I have every single figure ever made, prototypes, unreleased stuff. Wow. Because I love G.I. Joe that much. And it's like, you know, people tell me, I, this guy hates G.I. Joe, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, listen, we're, we're competitors now. But I made my line because of my love for G.I. Joe. So, you know, Steel Brigade is my all-time favorite G.I. Joe. And I purchase the trademark for steel brigade so that i could put steel brigade in my own line because i you know i i figured well if hasbro's not going to do a gi joe line i want to make sure that i get a steel brigade out there it's awesome hey mike you want to jump in here <laughs> uh i do actually when yeah. when you did go back to school for uh for toy making mm -hmm. how much of that was dedicated to engineering um there was there was a bit of it um we had uh, a few classes where we talked about like methods and materials and things like that. So you learned about the different plastics and you learned about, you know, tooling and production. Now, I learned more during my internships at Hasbro about the engineering side of things than I did while I was at, at FIT. FIT was very focused on the design end of things. And, uh, you know, but I looked at it as like I wanted to be well-rounded. I wanted to know everything about the toy industry not just one singular thing so it was like you know a lot of the you know the kids in my class they were just singularly focused on just designing i want to draw on a design i was like no no no, no. i want to i want to be like i want to know it all so like when during my internships i would talk to the old timers because you it wasn't like the, the information was just there in a binder like you had to go to these guys and like ask them questions and i was like a sponge and I probably annoyed the hell out of them, but I don't care because I got the knowledge that I have today because I, I took the chance and asked these guys questions and I wanted to know these things. And, you know, now that has allowed me to be able to go out and, you know, create a company on my own. And I handle all the day to day of this. I handle the marketing. I handle the social media. I handle the engineering. I handle the, the production and the things and the designing. So, you know, when you when you you're just a designer at Hasbro, but when, you know, when you leave, it's like, well, you could just keep being a designer. I chose to just do something different, but it allowed me to like learn new things and you got to hit, you got to hit the ground running because it's like, well, I wasn't a marketer, but I market the hell out of my line. Now I don't have an MBA. So, you know, I, I look at it like, you know, there are some marketers at Hasbro that made a, a ton of money and had MBAs, but 
I market, you know, a, a multi-million dollar line right now. So, you know, what does that say? Uh, you know? Yeah. I mean, you just got to jump right in there, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it works. You look at, you know, people that start companies and, uh, you know, I watch – a lot of these like toys that made us and the food that made us and the whatever different shows that they have on there. And the, the common thread is usually, you know, uh, necessity is a mother of invention and it always pushes somebody into leaving their comfort zone. So you have to do things first. You have to teach yourself how to do things, you know, um, you know, look at Disney. I mean, geez, you know, Walt was always coming up with crazy ideas, you know, him and his Imagineers and they were doing it first. Yeah, but that that you know, so a lot of people, you know, they talk about you know formal training. Some, sometimes you really can't, you know, train somebody formally to do something that's like so niche, like you know, action figures or uh, you know, even comic books. Now it's hard. Yeah. Like you can learn the, you know, the, the skill set. You can learn, you know, from like going to the Kubert School. But as far as like getting your stuff out there and you know, becoming transitioning from an artist to a publisher, uh, and that's something that just kind of happens at necessity for a lot of people. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you just have to be well-rounded with everything. I mean, listen, Rob Liefeld's perfect example. Guy's art was terrible. It drove me nuts that he got so much work because his art was terrible, but he was a, a personality and he yeah. sold himself. And it's like, there are so many people that come to me and say, Hey, can you give me any advice on like starting my own toy line? And we're in this age where like, with crowdfunding, people think it's easy. They could oh, yeah. oh, I could just crowdfund something and get someone to pay for my stuff. And it's like, listen, you need a lot of capital up front. I, I put a ton of my own savings into Action Force before the Kickstarter even started. But you gotta you gotta be able to sell yourself and like push your property. It's not gonna you can't just rely on other people to just buy it and yeah. you're not selling it well. You know, there's no there is no book, you know, like like no one told me like, oh, hey, when you started this thing, take into consideration when you ship out series one, you're going to spend five thousand dollars on Uline boxes to ship that stuff out. You're like, whoa, you know, so it's like I've, I've talked to some people who are starting toy lines and yes. I'm like, hey, this is the kind of stuff you got to take into consideration. You got to mm -hmm. take into consideration the, the ocean freight, which goes up on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something I don't think people take into consideration. Tooling changes and this and that are. You know, doing hard copies at 104 percent. Why you have to do that? And I, it, and it's like, you know, I've always, I get a lot of flack because you know people are like, well, you're a small business. Why aren't you supporting other small business? Because I've said, I don't like people just coming into the toy industry and just doing it. And I make the analogy like, you know, I like this this drink, this energy drink. Well, just because I like this energy drink and I'm a fan of it doesn't mean I'm going to just decide tomorrow. You know what? I bet I can, I'm going to go and start my own energy drink company. I don't know anything about it. Just because you're a toy collector and you're a toy fan does not mean you should get into the toy industry. If you want to do it, go get an education first, go get experience, go do stuff. I just don't like the, I'm going to hire a guy to do a sculpt. I'm going to make a toy. I'm going to crowdfund it. And then you run into problems. If you don't have a good project manager between you and China, you know, are you going to go out to China? Are you going to go talk to the factories? Like, do you know what a cost sheet is? Can you read a cost sheet? Can you figure out your, your profit margins and that sort of thing? Can you figure out your wholesale for your wholesale partners? All that sort of thing. That's stuff that it's not taught. You got to like have the experience and figure it out. So, you know, again, there's no, there's no book, you know, you have to, you have to get the experience and, you know, there's really no other way of doing it without getting the experience. I think you just ruined Tom's dream of getting into the toy industry because <laughs> we, we had done a little bit of a price lookup for. Oh yeah. We, well, toys. no, we were, we were okay. Okay. So, I mean, it's funny you mentioned like that cause we, uh, we do publish comics and we're running into a lot of the same uh, issues publishing comics. We're actually working on games right now too, that, you know, you're talking about the toy industry, you know, supply chain issues, cost of shipping, warehousing. We actually, I'm actually in our, warehouse uh right now but uh you know we've been doing this for a few years but yeah i was actually i was actually looking at uh uh eventually maybe not doing a full line but maybe doing a figure or two because you know i went to power con it was pretty cool i'm seeing all these people make independent toys but i know it's like it is a monumental undertaking like compared to doing a comic like not that doing comics or tabletop games are easy 
but it is definitely uh you know just even kind of glancing out like yeah this is this is way different than like hey i'm gonna print some books on paper and <laughs> get them from and ship them and whatever i mean we've done plushies before and we've had we've run into issues with that you talk about you know the communication with china mm -hmm. we've gotten some interesting things back <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's like i mean i can imagine it's like a totally different totally different ball game it's something you got to be all in with yeah. you know that's why i said like if you know some of these people that are doing you know a toy line it's not their full-time job and it's like it's got to be your full-time job yeah yeah you know and and you can tell the difference like you go to PowerCon and you see a company like mine that grew so fast and and, and, and so quickly and became successful well it's because i'm all in on it I'm all in yep. and I'm, I'm, I'm pushing, I'm selling it. And you see some of these other, you know, companies there that maybe aren't totally all in with it. And you can tell the difference. You oh yeah. yeah. See where there's a, uh, you know, a, a, a difference between, you know, putting out a ton of items and being successful and, and pushing it, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty obvious, but again, it's, you know, and they can say like, Hey, you know, no, I'm all in, I'm all in, but if you're all in it, it, it'd be different, you know? There's there's a, a realism to it all. I'm seeing some companies that I cover get a IP, an old IP, mm -hmm. one that still has brand value, but then they make one toy and then they just drop it. Or yeah. if it comes out, it's terrible. I, I've seen that. Unfortunately, I'm not really going to mention the company, but I've, I've backed some of their stuff and the stuff I got in return was just terrible. Like, how can you make a toy line when all the paint is flaking off of your first figure that you're putting out? You, you, it's like someone just slapped it on there or yeah, yeah. you're getting bad engineering. That's why I stress so hard of engineering is it's got to be functional, not just display wise. If, yep. if you want to bend an, an elbow or something, it can't pop out of the socket or the pin can't push out. But I think people, some toy makers got into this because they saw how easy 3d printing was, especially resin 3d printing. Mm -hmm. They felt like, wow, I could just pump out a whole bunch of these and just mm. print them myself. Like, no, you need tooling. You need proper tooling. Yes. Printing's great for a prototype, but that's as far as it can really go. I've tried to mass produce things on my 3D printer and I just can't. There's no there's no consistent quality yeah. like there is with like tool and die. Oh, 100 I I couldn't agree more. And you know, I I'll probably get I mean, I already get a lot of a lot of flack for this because I'm very anti 3D printing. Um, you know, which pains me to say because my this the sculptor who does all my weapons mark two designs unbelievable and he's ex-military so he knows weapons really well he you know he does his own 3d printing and selling but you know he he knows he gets it he he understands but he also has produced his stuff in plastic he's done injection molding for some of his weapons so he 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 knows that there's a big difference but there's you know there's a company that i've talked you know very negatively about that does 3d printing and there's a huge difference and it's like their stuff is so expensive and it's hand painted and at the end of the day you can you can try to pull the wool over people's eyes and call your your 3d printed resin any sort of scientific name at the end of the day it is not plastic it is not injection molded plastic it's not abs it's not P pvc so you get the stuff and people are like yeah i got it and it's warped yeah i yeah. a friend gave me one of their guns it's warped because 3d printing the resin it, it 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 will bend and warp and stuff like that mm -hmm. based on the temperatures. You see 3D printing lines in it, no matter how good the printers are. And it's like you get it; it's hand painted. And all of a sudden, you feel the paint's coming off on your hands. And it's like, I I don't like that. It's like how can you how can you charge twelve dollars for one gun, but yet I can charge twelve dollars and you get like fifteen guns. Like, mm -hmm. I don't like it. And it's like. They have a, 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 a fan base that's, you know, rabid like my fan base, but, you know, it's very small. And they're like, no, their stuff is great. It's like, okay, well, if you want to spend $40 for a gear pack to make this one OG looking figure that already costs you $25, it's like, at the end of the day, you're going to spending $70 to make this version of this figure. It's like, I'm selling gear packs for $12. So it's like, mm -hmm. there's, there's never going to be this this wave of just 3d printing is going to take over everything it's never because like you said it's there's a huge yeah. difference between 3d printing and injection molded plastic plus it's 
it's the manufacturing time. It's like you have to wait for that thing to print that part every time. What if you leave the office for the day while the printer's running and then something happens and, you know, the printer stops running or there's a glitch and you, your whole batch of prints is, is gone because you wasted all that time overnight. Yep. Too temperamental. It's never going to replace real plastic toys. Never. So you mentioned the price point. That's actually what shocked me about uh, Action Force when I, I hit your table at PowerCon was the prices were very sane. I mean, for a small <laughs> toy company, because I'm used to seeing like, oh, yeah, this this uh, four inch figure. Yeah, it's like 50 bucks, you know, but your prices are comparable to the uh, the big H. And yep. uh, that was yep. that was surprising. Yep. A lot better. A lot better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, listen, at the end of the day. Like I, I'm a collector, so I know what I spend on stuff and, you know, yeah, you can squeeze that sponge as hard as you can, but eventually you're going to run out of water. Like there's going to be nothing left. So why are mm -hmm. you going to squeeze your consumer? To me, it's like, you know, when I first came out the line, when I first did the Kickstarter, the, the figures were $32. And I remember there were some haters that were like, that's too expensive. That's really expensive. Well, here we are, you know, three years later, and my prices haven't gone up, yet you see Hasbro continue to just jump and jump and jump yep. and jump and jump. And now there's rumors that this year they're going to go to $30. 30 $33 on Hasbro's site. $33. <laughs> and that figure doesn't come with anywhere near what mine comes with for nope. 32 But now it's like I just made the announcement at Joe Fest this year that we're dropping prices. And mm -hmm. we're not dropping prices because the company's doing bad. We're dropping prices because – the company is getting so successful that my quantities are going up. And when your quantities go up, your costs go down. Mm -hmm. So now I could be greedy and I can just take all that money for myself. Or I can say, no, I want to do something to give back and say, hey, we're cutting prices across the board. We're dropping. We're the only company that's ever dropped prices because, you know, for the fans, for the, for the consumer, everyone else is raising prices. And I like... Yeah, like I wanted to, to do something that is affordable, but I want you to feel like what you're getting is a great value. At, at $32, mm -hmm. look at everything you're getting with that figure. And when we're going to 30 for the figures, starting with um, Series 4 in October, those figures, we didn't cut anything from them. We changed the packaging to a blister card. That helped a little bit of cost. But again, a lot of it comes from the MOQ, the quantities. You know, I, I don't want any of my offering to change at all. I'm not going to cut deco. I'm not going to cut accessories, this, this, and that. I want to give you the same offering year, year in and out. I just want to give you guys a little break on the price. And when I first did the, the Kickstarter and I had the figures at 32, there were some companies at the same factory that I was at that, you know, we're selling their figures really high. And, you know, they, they were talking to other people that I know and they were like, you know, he's, he's really, you know, hurting us because he's selling his figures so cheap. He should be selling them for more. It's like, no, no, a six inch figure should not be $40 or $50. It's like, no, you're doing a, a very exclusive run of something or soft goods or something like that. Or if it's a deluxe figure. Okay. But you can't just like sell a figure for $50 as a regular series figure. Like you're never going to grow your business. You have to allow for people to buy multiple items. And yeah. that was my goal. I want to make something where we, we offer gear packs, weapons packs, you know, basic troopers, regular figures, because I want to give you guys a whole plethora of stuff to buy, but I want you to feel like at the end of the day, if you spent $500, you looked at everything you got and you're like, wow, I got a ton of stuff. That, that's cool. Yeah, it's one thing with um, Hasbro, even their prices are creeping up. I was shocked uh, the other day, Black Series Boba Fett was $34.99 at yes. Walmart. Yeah. Yep. Is that right? I mean, my wife took a picture of it. She's like, you will not believe how much the Black Series figures are. And I'm like, uh, one, I don't care because I don't collect them anymore. But two, I'm like, what? <laughs> 35 one, bucks? Yeah, one peg over the rest of the Return wow. of the Jedi series is still $24.99. I don't know what the difference is. It's the same Boba Fett figure that they've been running for the past 10 years in yeah. the Black Series. Exactly the same, except yeah. he comes with a couple effects pieces. Those effects pieces aren't worth $10. No. <laughs> I, I bought that. So I that Return of the Jedi Boba Fett, I bought that because I was like, let me see what you get for $35. Bucks. <laughs> oh, my Just God. So I know. Like, I right. want to compare like what I'm selling mine for and what – because people are like, 
oh, well, look, this deluxe Boba Fett, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, well, there's no stand. Mine have stands. Mine have, you know, eight hands. Mm -hmm. You didn't get any extra hands. He had one blaster and then one blaster cut in half. And then he had some of the flame effects. And I'm like, this is not $35. And, a, and a one terrible. small one small fabric piece. One oh, that's soft, right. One yeah. soft good piece. Yep. That's it. Yep. <laughs> but then even like, I look at the, the Joes now, the classified Joes, because that's my direct competition. Mm-hmm. You know, their their deluxe figures, you know, their snow job was I think he's he's 30 bucks or 35. Mm -hmm. What he comes with is nowhere near the amount of stuff that my figures come with at the the now thirty dollar offering. Mm -hmm. So it's like even even that's bad. But perfect example is that Sarge, you know, totally different. Yeah, uh, I I. I understand where Hasbro came from with their Sergeant Slaughter. They tried to capture the character as he appeared in that medium. He did not, yeah. not a classified version, just tried to catch it, but the, the face is wrong. Yeah. Uh, but even when I look at all the Joes that I've been collecting, I picked up Snake Eyes and Timber last week. It was $44. And when I opened it up, I'm like the paint is terrible. Like since they went to uh, windowless packaging, I noticed it was yeah. on Shipwreck when I reviewed Shipwreck. The paint is much worse now. They're not trying as hard. And the the accessories, like the guns, like um on uh, the one scuba diver, I forgot his name. What's like he? yeah, they're 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 super flimsy now. They're not rigid. So I'm like, everything is bent, everything's wrong. Nothing, there's no there's no dull coat on any of the paint. He looks super shiny. Wow, what the hell? <laughs> there it feels like I mean, we talked about this, Mike and I talked about it. Uh, you know, both being toy collectors and Hasbro, it seems like they are using the windowless packaging to hide defects in the product. You know, that's just outside observation as a collector. Um, and actually, we have a we have a small retail location too. I'm noticing that the the product is not as good as it used to be, and it's almost always the windowless packaging. You open the Dungeons and Dragons figures; they're falling apart. You open, uh, you know, I, I've got these uh, seven inch Power Ranger. I like these little Power Ranger uh, Zords. And uh, yeah, they look great on the front, but there's like no paint on the back at all, you know? And it, it just really seems like they're cutting a lot of corners uh, these days. Yeah. Also, you got to, you have to hold your factory accountable. You know, listen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Action Force has not been flawless. Like we had some production issues on Series One, and we had a, a mold defect on a figure in Series Two, which, we fix, we sent, you know, replacement parts for that, but you got to address that stuff. You know, yes. It's like, I get a lot of samples in and I nitpick the crap out of them. I send every little question, just like this has to change. This has to change. This has to change. You got to hold your factory accountable. You have to have a good team that makes sure that you get that kind of stuff across. And it's like, when I see like companies putting out bad products or, you know, there's a company out there that I don't speak highly of. They, they're missing like accessories that they showed in the pre-order or missing paint apps or stuff just is totally different from what it looked like in the digital render. And it's just like, you've got to have a good team of us designers that understand stuff and will make those comments. And then you have to have a good team that can get that information to the factory to make sure those changes are made. Now also like a figure leaving the factory that's missing a, 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 an apron for a figure that was clearly shown on the pre-order. It's like that should never, ever happen because you get rounds of samples. You get test shots. You get EP samples. You got FEP samples. You Sometimes you get a second round of FEP samples. I don't let a, an item leave the factory until I have signed off on that final FEP sample because it has to be right. So yeah. it's like if your whole entire production run is off, that means someone didn't sign off on a final sample mm -hmm. to be able to have a production run go in that missed an entire accessory in the whole production run. Like, how does that happen? That happens because you don't have a, a team of competent people that are are looking and making these things and your, your system in place is flawed. You have to make sure in the schedule you have these different rounds of samples to test. So 
you know, speaking of Hasbro, back to Hasbro. And look, I don't want to put you in a position where you got to keep dunking on Hasbro. No, right? no. Listen, I spent seven years there. Oh my, you know, it's a it's a part of my life. It's a part of history. Hasbro made me who I am today, and I appreciate my time with Hasbro. I loved my time at Hasbro. I worked on amazing items. I worked with great people. I had great experiences there. I worked on great properties. So, you know, it, it was it was a good time. Some most of the time. Most of the time. So it doesn't seem like it's the same company now. I got to no. be honest. So the culture doesn't seem the same. I know some other people that, that used to work there and no longer work there. And, you know, there's, there's that kind of wistfulness in their eyes when they talk about their time at the company, but it's not the same company. And as a consumer, and that's what Mike and I were talking about in the previous uh, podcast, it doesn't seem like their focus is really to make toys. Now, like they don't want to make toys. They want to be in the video game business or the movie business or something else. And the toys are just like, well, we got to do it. <laughs> because people expect us to make them, but we're just going to put the minimal effort in, uh, charge as much as we can. 60 bucks for a shitty transformer. They're going to buy it, whatever, you know, throw it in the box and boom, ship it off to Walmart. Yeah, it, it's I mean, that was the saddest part for me was seeing a different company than what I saw when I when I first saw it. And I wanted to work there like during my internship in 2010 or 2011. I saw. The boys, the boys action team had this camaraderie to them. And the guy who ran the whole division, every Friday, he would have this giant meeting. He'd bring everyone to the we these conference room tables, like right in the center of the whole design area. He'd get everyone from the Transformers team, from the G.I. Joe team, from the Marvel team, from the Star Wars team. Everyone come out on a Friday. We'd all sit there and have a big team meeting. This way, there was this camaraderie. You knew what people were doing. You got to talk to people and like it was just this this togetherness. You felt like you were part of something big and you were making toys. Then it's like I get there and everything's very siloed. It's like I was working on Spider-Man. My friend over here was working on Avengers. He was working on Guardians of the Galaxy. He was working on whatever stuff. We didn't know what everyone was doing. Like you had to go and seek out those people and say, hey, what are you working on? Or you'd see it at a, at a, 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 mar a marketing meeting or a sales meeting or something like that. There was no more because the guy who ran the boys team, he got laid off in 2012 and hmm. people ran it different. They also used to do like these off sites. You know, I was heard about these, these, I forgot where they went. They went somewhere in like Massachusetts. They'd get the whole team. You, they bust you out there and you'd camp for like two days and you'd go out there and you do like team building exercises. But then at night, you know, you get fire pits and you start drinking and, you know, you're horsing around. It's like the, it, it was such a cool thing to do. But it was like when I got there, they uh, we got no, it's, it's too expensive. We cut the budget. You know, we're not doing those, those cool off sites anymore. There was no togetherness, no camaraderie. But also, like like you were saying, like. You know, I would walk the halls and I would feel like the people there didn't remember we made toys. Yeah, I would sit in these management meetings where the CEO was there. And I remember coming out with when I was doing the prop replica stuff, we did a Spider-Man mask and we built a shell and it, the mask stretched over. So it, the real actor, that's like what he wore to keep mm -hmm. that, sh that, that shape of the Spider-Man head. I remember like I was out in the hallway and I put the mask on. And I ran into the, the meeting and I jumped over a table and I came out like this, like with the Spider-Man mask on. And I remember this, this guy, Brian Goldner, the, the CEO, sat there just like this. Just like that. And it's just like, you do you know where you are? Do you know? <laughs> we're not making soap here. Like we're making toys. Yeah. There was no fun. Like there was no fun at all. I mean, and it was like. It's like the Robin Williams movie, Toys. Well, yeah. You get this takeover and it just loses its soul. <laughs> yep. Yep. We, yeah. Like, yeah. Cause I watched the, um, I think it was a toys that made us or the toys that build America. One, one of the episodes, but they, they were talking about GI Joe mm -hmm. and the culture, you know, back in the eighties, they Hasbro and they were like, I mean, they were firing on all cylinders. I mean, they were yeah. always coming up with ideas and these guys, I mean, they seem like they were, you know, you talk to them, like they were designed to build, build toys that's like with these yeah. guys you could tell it's in their dna they love toys they like play they like to come up with these wild ideas 
and it, it reminded me a lot of, you know, like Disney Imagineering back in the day. It was like they were mm-hmm. always just kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall. And was, yeah, these weird toy lines, but, you know, aerators and, and visionaries and all this <laughs> weird stuff that would never fly now. But they were trying new things. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, wouldn't it be cool if we had ships that shot air? Yeah, it's cool. Let's do that. Let's make a comic book and a cartoon. There you go. Millions of dollars. Just boom, go do it. Didn't work. Oh, well, that's OK. We got we got Transformers. We got G.I. Joe. We're good. Um but yeah, it was just like they just always come up with new ideas and it just seemed like they just stopped. At some point, they just like stop innovating and they're like, well, we've got these like five properties now, uh, <laughs> Transformers and Ponies and we bought Dungeons and Dragons and we're just going to milk the same five things now until the end of time. We're not going to make anything new because yeah. that's too hard. We don't want to do that. Well, it became, it became about entertainment. It's like I saw it on the Marvel license. You know, every year around like October, we would have to start innovating and coming up with new lines to pitch in like November, December, so that that went into the line review. And then we'd start, you know, we'd have a year to make that stuff. Well, we would, you know, they, they'd they ask for, we want innovation, innovation, innovation. You come up with this amazing stuff, all these cool ideas and this and that. And then you'd pitch it to retail and retail be like, no. Like Marvel, they had these things called Titan Heroes. We we always mm. called them shampoo bottles. They were the yeah 90, yeah yeah nine twelve inch yeah yeah. I like we hated them. We hated them, but it was like I, I worked on a lot of them, and I was like, well, I got to work on them. I might as well make them as cool of a shampoo bottle as possible, you know. But it's they sucked, you know. And it was like, but they sold hundreds of millions of dollars in 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 sales for for these Titan Heroes, but. Again, retail was like, no, nah, we just want Titan Hero. It's like when I was working on Guardians 2, I came out with this whole line called Mix Power. And the figures came with cassettes, cassette tapes that were all keyed. Each character had a different one. And then the Milano had the the the, the stereo in it. So you, you plug Star-Lord's cassette in and it played a different song or, oh, vo- cool. or different voices. Rockets was different. This and that. With this amazing line and retail was like, no, nah, we just want a skew of legends and a Titan hero and then the dancing group. And you're just like, for real? Mm-hmm. For real? We're giving you all this innovation and you don't want any of it. So it's like you have your team saying innovate, but then you have retail saying no. And it's like no one at Hasbro would push retail, you know, to, to say no, like, no, take this. This is an awesome line. It was it was so like defeating because you'd work for months on this stuff and because someone didn't have the balls to stand up and push retail to take something and believe in it, they would just be like, oh, no, oh, Target, you don't want to? Okay, thanks. All right, sorry, guys. All that, that time and money you wasted on ideation, yeah, we're not doing it anymore. I'm just like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? So it's 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 defeating, man. It sucked. It definitely well, sucked. Speaking of um, innovating, I know the action force is going into vi- vehicles. Yeah. Uh, so – Give me the rundown of how how that came about and how taxing that was to to get something of that scale into production. It started out as a, as a as a joke, and you know, <laughs> my fans were trolling me over it because I would be on podcasts and you know questions always come up: When are you doing vehicles? When are you doing vehicles? And it's like I literally every podcast I was on, I had to answer this question. It's like no one listened to the podcast I was on previously, and I would always say like listen, we're, we're, we're in our infancy. We'll get there eventually. But I know, like I knew it would be a couple of years before I, I got into vehicles. I thought it'd be like three, four five years. But again, you're making a military line. You got to make vehicles. But got to the point where my fans were trolling me and they'd pay for super chats on our show. And they'd be like, Hey Bobby, when are you doing vehicles? And it would just, it would get this laugh and it became this joke. And, but then it got to the point where I was like, I should probably start working on a vehicle, you know? So secretly behind the scenes, I started working on, you know, an idea for a vehicle. Like what, what is the right vehicle to do? Also price point price Mm -hmm. point at this scale is really, really hard Mm -hmm. because we saw some things fund. We saw some things not fund and ghost rider. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Engine (laughs) engine agreed. It didn't, it didn't fund that kind of thing, but it's like, you know, but also Hasbro did the snow speeder for Black Series, which I have, and I think it's an amazing vehicle. Yeah. But it's you know, it's 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 big, but it's just a two-part shell kind of thing. 
not much to it, but it's an iconic vehicle and I love it. So it's what is the right vehicle to do? So I was designing something and it, I wasn't really getting the look I wanted. I wanted this aggressive vehicle, this thing you're, you, you want to ride into battle and you want to scare the enemy with like, and I was just like, ah, you know, so I kind of like put it on the back burner. I said, eh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll get back to vehicles. You now I got too much going on. And then I was watching the terminal list with Chris Pratt and I'm watching the show. And in one of the episodes, he's going after these, these bad guys and they, they flee this building and they get into a bunch of, you know, like, you know, escalades and black blacked out convoy vehicles. But then all of a sudden there's this vehicle in the rear that is not like an escalate. It's not, it's, a, it's like an SUV, but it's really aggressive, mm-hmm. big tires, just, just gnarly looking. And I was like, what is that thing? So I immediately got my phone, Googled like, you know, terminal list vehicle and immediately pictures of it came up and it was by this company called Resvani. So I looked at this company and Resvani is a private company out in California. They make high end security vehicles. So they have this, this vehicle called the tank and it's what the Vanguard, my vehicle is based off of. They sell them. They have different versions. They start at like a hundred grand. Mm-hmm. They have a version that is that is bulletproof glass. It has gas masks in the seats. It it blows out smoke from the back. It has anti puncture tire. So if you're like a a diplomat or this billionaire or something like that, you can have your security vehicle. Like that that's what they make it for. And you know now athletes are starting to buy them because they they became this this thing. They have a six wheel truck called a Hercules. They just came out with a new vehicle in their lineup called the, the, the vengeance. It is awesome looking. And this one football player got the first one off the production line. So they're this really cool company, you know, American made that sort of thing, but it's an amazing vehicle. So I said, let me just reach out to them. I reached out to them and I said, I introduced myself to them and I said, you know, this is what I do. I make a toy company. I would love to include your vehicle, you know, the, the tank, in in my line and make the hero vehicle based off the tank. And they loved it. They loved the idea. They're like, this is so cool. The owner was like, this is great. So we got a contract done where I licensed the rights to, you know, the Resvani vehicles. And I used that as the basis. So it's, it's a Resvani tank, but we added a turret to it. We added some, mm-hmm. some more, uh, a more military mm-hmm. feel to it. And I called it the Vanguard. So Resvani loves it. You know, and it got to the point where, you know, started like really like getting this thing into development. But then I'm just like, all right, well, how do I go about, you know, making it available, doing pre orders mm-hmm. that, that sort of thing? What's it going to cost? That's everyone's question. What is it going to cost? Because it's big. It's 20 inches long. It's like 10 inches high. It holds 10 figures. It's got all, you know, all these bells and whistles. The engine of engines comes out. Or maybe it was the. I'm trying to think of what was first, the his tank or the engine of vengeance. His tank was first. His tank was first. Yeah, so his, his tank, tank got funded before vengeance. His tank comes out, it's 300 bucks. Mm-hmm. And it funded immediately. Oh yeah. I was like, "Whoa. <laughs> okay. People want a 6-inch military vehicle." However, the GI Joe fan base is a bit starved, so they're taking anything they can get. Especially an iconic vehicle like the his tank. Yep. So I'm like, "Okay. All right. That's more more knowledge, more ammo for me to figure out this whole plan. And then the engine of engines comes out. That's $350. And we saw what happened with that. And there was a fan backlash. Yep. It was a car. Don't know if it was compelling or the fact that the, it was a high price point. So I said, all right, I know what people will pay for. I know what people won't pay for. It. So then I'm just like, all right, trying to figure this out. Now I'm like, you know, I see the Thunder Tank. That's $500. And I'm just like, listen, six inch scale vehicles. You know, I, I started seeing my costing come in and I'm like, wow, these are great numbers. Like, are these companies all just so greedy? Like, yeah. <laughs> so then I'm just like formulating this plan. Then it, you know, at, at Joe Fest this year, I announced a price range. I said, all right, this is everything it's going to come with. And I started teasing them. I said, all right, what do you think about $300? We crossed that out. I said, what do you mean? Two, 275? No. 250? No. 200? Mm-hmm. No, and I even do 200. I gained the range of 170 to 190 because I knew that that's where my range was going to be. And people lost it. They were like, 
How are you going to make this six inch vehicle that's this big for under $200? So then at PowerCon, I announced the official price of $184.99. So $185, you get a vehicle with a figure, with the turret, with all the, the gear in it. And it's like, my profit margin is, is great, you know, and it's, it's going to be successful, but also I'm not doing it as a crowdfund. I'm making this thing. I already paid mm -hmm. for the tooling. I'm going to pay for the production run. I, the only reason I'm doing pre-orders is just to raise the, the, the quantity. Like I already committed to a certain quantity with the factory. So if I sell 10 of them, I'm still doing the thousands that I've, I've already committed to, but the pre-orders will allow us to see if we can go, much higher and i think mm -hmm. we will at this price point i think people are going to buy multiples and that's what you want to do do you want to make a 250 dollars vehicle that people can say all right i like it i can afford to buy one or do you want to make something that's so cool but is so affordable that people are like i can buy two or three of those you know i think people were buying multiple his tanks again that's 300 dollars, but that was niche that was iconic and that was yeah. a starved fan base this is something that's just a great offering. So we're going to see the pre-orders are going to go up. I wanted to get them up in September, but I have a lot of other things going up for pre-order in September. So I think I'm going to move it out to like the beginning of October. And I'm going to see, I think this thing's going to be very, very successful. Yeah. I, I am confident yeah. enough in it. If I wasn't confident enough in it, I wouldn't be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in tooling and production to do this thing. Mm -hmm. what, what not that's an unknown but i believe in it and and based on the fan feedback people are excited about this thing so you know that was the the long journey of of getting vehicles into the action force line how how modular is it how much can you add and subtract to it on a whim so the the turrets are will have different you know different turrets you can you can it'll come with a regular machine gun turret mm -hmm. and then we're going to have an add-on that you can buy that's the missile launcher add-on you know we'll do different turrets down the, the road also the doors are removable um, so that we can always switch out the doors for mm -hmm. something more armored or things like that. But uh, other than that, you know, it's not like you can take the whole thing apart and, and, and right. do that. But way. at least like the main play feature, which is the, the turret yep. can be modified. That's, that's yeah, the biggest so you thing. You can take the turret yeah. off and then it has just a, a cap on the top. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want the turret and you just want the vehicle, ride it like that but if you want an extra guy in there throw the turret on you know it's it's awesome what yeah. can we get a, a uss flag <laughs> <clears throat> i'd pay i'd pay a grand i'd That'd pay a like grand a, for yeah, like a oh, oh, oh tri flag. triple that <laughs> triple that that's uh six inch flag uh, there's no way it could be on. more than than yeah. uh huts than a jabba's uh barge, Stale barge. yeah <laughs> I mean, the, pro the problem with that stuff is and that's what i i started dealing with when I was creating this is space, you mm -hmm. know, as collectors, we only have a finite amount of space. Yeah. A lot of us don't have mansions where we can just spread all this stuff out. And so many companies are putting out so many, so much product that we're running out of space. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. When you do a vehicle, it's like, <laughs> yeah. where are you going to put this thing? You know? So, you know, like, the snow speeder is great, but it's like that thing takes up a big footprint. I know yeah, that's why I didn't. That's why I didn't buy it. I had yeah. the slave one, and slave one took up an entire corner. There was like, yeah, uh, where can I put? Fighter. Where can I put this triangle of a yep. ship? <laughs> the Black Series Tie Fighter did not do well. That yeah. thing is massive, massive. Yeah. So it's like you want to make something that is big and has a great value to the price but also doesn't doesn't become a coffee table, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, the sail barge, it's like, that thing is it's seven feet long, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, where do you put this stuff? So, you know, that's that's huge, you know? We were talking about, you know, I'm on a, I'm going to do a cheap plug real quick. I'm on a, a bi-weekly show, me and, and my other two friends, we host a show called The 3POA. It's a great show. We have a great time talking about, you know, toys. We'll get into the really nitty gritty of the inner workings of toys and what people think of them and stuff. Great time. But we were talking about, you know, the new HasLab and then what they could do moving forward. And it's like we, we brought up the Blackbird for, you know, for X-Men. Mm -hmm. And could you do a six inch scale Blackbird? Like how big would that be? Would it be sail barge size? Because that's a huge plane. Now you'd have to have some liberties and bring the scale down a little bit. but Seriously, how big would that be for six inch scale figures? You know, 10 feet. Yeah. 10 feet. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, who who's got room for that? Yeah, you know? <laughs> it would have to. It would, they would have to put it at three point seven five mm-hmm. inch scale, which unfortunately yeah. Hasbro right now. Well, they do. They for X Men ninety seven, they do have a smaller do, scale yeah. Yeah. set. But I mean, Hasbro would cut out that entire Marvel yep. small size, except for the um, uh, the Secret Wars size ones. Yeah, which I think yeah. are going out because I haven't seen any on shelves. Le- past is that month. Legends? No, it was uh, yeah, it was it was still called Legends, but it would yeah. it was demarked by something else. But yeah, I think they're gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah and that, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say the only brand that can really survive three and three quarter slash four inches Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, you notice like the one Black Series uh, six inch scale Haslab they did failed. But yeah. what has prospered for them is the four inch stuff. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, that's the, the ghost. Yeah, this the ghost, the sail barge, um, you know, it's it, the the razor crest. Like, and I think why that does well is because you have this fan base that has such a huge investment into the four inch line. Whereas Marvel, there it was always six inch. Toy Biz was six inch. Hasbro got it. They did some six inch, but then they went to Universe. But People still wanted that six inch sale because that's what they had built with Toy Biz. And then when they brought six inch back, eventually it pushed four inch out. And six inch is what everyone wants. So certain lines have established scale. Star Wars is one of those weird, weird ones that has managed to do both. Um, I was working at Jazzwares uh, for a few months back in 2019. And I was working on the Fortnite line. <laughs> And I remember like we were doing four inch figures and six inch figures. And I was like, guys, one of these is going to win out because you haven't established either scale and the fans are going to make you pick one. And eventually their six inch stuff lost. And then it went to Hasbro and they kept doing four inch stuff. But even that's starting to slow down. There's only a few on the shelf. Hasbro got the six inch Fortnite figures and they couldn't solve it either. Yeah. So it's very rare that you could do two scales in, in one brand. Star Wars is that one, you know, um, you know, GI Joe, they did this, the sky striker funded people wanted it, but then they tried doing O-ring figures and nobody wanted them. They looked mm-hmm. like crap, but that line failed and they canceled it. But it's like, why did the sky striker succeed? Well, because people have this established collection and they wanted to upgrade the sky striker in their collection. That's why, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah, I actually like the Marvel Legends though, because I, I, I always had a soft spot for uh, Secret Wars, the Mattel mm-hmm. line. So I always liked that that size. I love that line. Yeah, it was so cool. It's so cheesy. To, it's, so you know, cheesy. It's, it's so funny because I remember um, freaking Kang. You could get him for ninety nine cents at KB yeah. Toys. Into like the early nineties, it was one of my first jobs. Mm-hmm. I worked at KB Toys, and he sat there for years. And now all of a sudden, they announced, "Hey, Kang's going to be the uh, the main villain in the." Uh, the MCU going forwards. Now these figures are going for ridiculous. You should, you should have stocked up on Kang figures. I could have had all the Kangs I wanted, man. I could have had the all... same. At KB Toys, it was the same thing with those uh, Robocop figures from the animated series. You'd yeah. find them into the 2000s. Yeah. No one yeah. was buying them. Nobody bought them. Uh, Star Wars figures, they had those two packs without the weapons. They sat yeah. there for years. Uh, I found the last series of Masters of the Universe. Yeah, there's a, a retailer in my area, 99 cents for Scareglow, Sorceress, mm-hmm. King Randor, and they were there until at least 1991. Nobody bought them. They didn't want them. <laughs> that's yeah, that's like, the crazy thing. When you see these rare figures and people get them graded and you see the sticker on them and what they're marked down to, it's like, so you have this figure now yeah. that's super, super rare, but was marked down because they couldn't sell them. Look at the Marion figure for the Kenner Indiana Jones line. Yeah. She's the most expensive figure in the line. She was a peg warmer, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and now she's warming pegs again. Now she's warming <laughs> pegs again. At least they're consistent. Um, but that that Secret Wars line, I get bo- like I get bored because, like, you, you know, collecting's a sickness. So mm-hmm. once I finish one collection, I have to go on to something else. And eventually, after I finished Superpowers, I was like, I'm going to go into Secret Wars. And it's such a cheesy line, but it's a small yeah. line. So it's a, you know, you can get it except for Iceman, Electro and, and Constrictor. Yeah. But I remember just like getting them and I'm just like, man, these figures are so cheesy, but they're so awesome. It's like Dr. Doom didn't come with a cape. All the figures kind of have like a, he had a hood, body. he had his he had hood, hood, but no, no cape, cape. Yeah. and a backpack. Yeah. And a Spider-Man, backpack. uh, the webbing, it didn't go the whole way around. He just had nope. like the, yeah. the web printed down the nope. middle. And then, um, 
my doctor doom i remember the paint kept coming off is mm -hmm. real easy yeah. like the paint came off real easy with those at least the wolverine figure was cool because it's yes yeah he had claws <laughs> yep. yeah but not a great line then you see like nah. you're like how did superpowers do such a great line and then secret wars is just like we're just gonna phone it in with this one play play gimmick it was yep. all down to the to the gimmick yep. I, i'm surprised that mcfarland's getting away with doing still doing power uh superpowers I, yeah. I can't but he's having to move it to online only because they're sitting there at walmart they're not moving well the problem was he went with the wrong scale yeah they're like, too big they're they're, they're larger big. it's like yeah. i love the idea of it yeah that was weird that was a weird choice it was weird but now i think because there was this backlash i think now he's actually doing the right scale and going very like pow power power um, uh superpower styled ones like the new batman with like the, the 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 half black face that looks like uh he's you know from the you know the, the from the, the original line. Comics. yeah like i saw it i'm like oh and then someone told me like that those are those are going to be the true scale i'm like okay well that's yeah. better you know but he screwed up the first time it's like man you dropped the ball it was such an easy thing to do they don't do anything that that's my biggest complaint with like look superpower superpowers that was the thing like all the toys back in the 80s they all, they all had a gimmick right yeah and and uh i get the you know modern collectors want posable toys but if you're gonna do a retro line you gotta have a gimmick yeah like mm -hmm. they gotta punch they gotta kick they gotta do some squirt water you know what the most annoying thing to me i, I collect <laughs> a lot of masters of the universe the origins they're pretty decent looking figures but i'm like yeah. if if that toy originally squirted water it better squirt water yeah if his eyes <laughs> bugged out they better bug out not you take his head off and then you put to 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 simulate an action features like you can't tell me now you're the guy that designs the toys but you can't tell me that a toy that sold for five or six bucks back in the 1980s uh would sell for more than twenty dollars now if they added a spring action or something to it because i'm sorry and and it's like cobra Con, he's he's a squirt bottle He's a squirt bottle with legs. That's not hard to do. You buy a squirt bottle for two bucks at Walmart. Yeah, I'm with you. you. Listen, the, the Mechanic, I was so disappointed by. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> you, okay, off off and put a you put that neck on and then the head on. I'm like, come on. that's You, you totally half-assed that even the Even the Four Horsemen figured out how to do it right back mm -hmm. in the 2000X line. Yeah. yeah. He had I a just, working. He had a working neck. <laughs> they all. They all had the the action features back. It mm -hmm. just blew my mind. It was like if you guys are going to go retro and you're charging twenty to twenty five dollars for these action figures, you can put some damn springs in sure. them. I'm just saying because that's what people want. They want more posable figures, but they also want them to be representative of the toys they had as kids. Yep. And they all did something. <laughs> but you then you're going to end up with ones that are permanently broken, like Bob the Goon, the Toy Biz <laughs> did. It was permanently <laughs> goose stepping. <laughs> Oh my God, uh, that is that is a uh, uh, that's a feature now, not a bug <laughs> for some yeah. people. Um, but uh, hey, so speaking of uh, uh, dark dark things, let's let's mm -hmm. can we can we segue into uh, the internet and uh, chat on the internet about your your action figure line if you don't mind? Sure, sure. Okay, dangerous road. <laughs> okay because i uh you know you've got a lot of people that i mean they respect the hell out of you because i know i got a lot of comments when we did the hasbro video they were asking specifically for you they're like you get bobby Val on because he's awesome and his stuff's really good and and uh you know he gets it he gets it uh some corners of the internet uh some gi joe fans uh disagree with that assessment now we've been on the receiving end of uh cri critique what are we gonna call it critique mike critique insanity if you want to be nice uh, mental mental <laughs> illness ourselves uh just because we don't like certain cartoon shows or comic books or movies or whatever and and people really do get uh get invested in this stuff but it does seem that there there is a uh a group of uh very uh pro hasbro fan <clears throat> pro hasbro fans that's how we're gonna we're gonna say it uh who who don't really uh care for your uh action force uh line there bobby what what do you have to say about that it's really funny um because one the thing i find hilarious is the 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 effort that they put in to to hate on me or hate on the line and stuff like that and i'm like listen like there's a forum that that has almost two thousand pages on, on it of just the same eight guys 
just crapping on me or crapping on the line. And it's like, guys, like, do you know the amount of time that you, you spent like writing your, your hate on, on this, on this forum, you could have learned a skill. You could have found some way to make money. You could have played with your kids. Like you could have did something to benefit your life, but it's like, you have the same eight guys that all are in this circle of, of, of hate. And it's like, listen, half of them buy my stuff anyway. There's a, <laughs> listen, we were, we were at Joe Fest right. and this guy comes to the booth and bought like $400 worth of product. And my buddy Ryan, who's on the 3POA with me, he's he goes, hey, man, you know who that was? I'm like, no. He goes, that's so-and-so. And I was like, huh? He goes, Oh, he craps on you all the time on that forum. And I'm like, ha, who won out there? Him or me? Oh my God. I got his money. So it's like, I find it hilarious. And it's like, I'm not trying to say I'm Steve Jobs or any any one of these successful billionaires. But, you know, when I meet someone that, that hates me, I'll say to them, do you have an iPhone? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, do you know Steve Jobs treated employees like absolute crap? And he was a like an, an evil person and he was just not friendly. And he was he was just like a an, an abrasive dude. It's like, well, but you're okay, right? You have your, your iPhone. So <laughs> why why is it the same? Like, listen, I'm not saying you have to like me. I listen, if you don't, great. But if you're like, I don't like him, I'm not buying that product. The product's cool, but I don't like him. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, okay. Listen, I don't like Hasbro. To this day, I listen, if Hasbro could offer me $100 million for my company. I'll take it, but I still won't like Hasbro. <laughs> I still buy their stuff. I have yeah. a bunch of their stuff. Like I have a ton of it. So it's like, you cannot like me. That's fine. But if you're like, I don't like him, I'm not buying it, but it's cool. Okay. But again, these guys, they're on there, they're hating, but half of them are buying it anyway. And also the things like that they hate me about, it all started because, listen, I am, I will be the first to admit, I am very outspoken about how I feel about the way other companies do business and what they put out. Because I feel very strongly about you have to put the consumer first. And you have to make an amazing item for that consumer. If, you're, if your item falters, if you have some issues, you fix them, but you address them. Every issue that I've ever had in this line, I've come out and I've addressed it and I've fixed it. And our line has improved greatly from series to series, but also I'm not going to run from the issues on it. We've sent out replacements. We're very vocal. Other companies won't even address stuff. No. Never. And I'm like, yeah. how do you do that? So be, again, because I'm I'm vocal and I, I criticize some of these companies, people don't <laughs> like it. When when you like are are hating on something someone else loves, they take it personally. And it's like, listen, do you think that corporation cares about you? You're a dollar sign to them. Yep. That's all they they're not gonna be, they're not gonna care about your feelings, they're not gonna do anything like that. I do fan polls. I, I've changed things in the line because fans have suggested it. This is a line for fans. Again, though, some people just like, he hates G.I. Joe. I, again, I have a room in my house dedicated to G.I. Joe. I definitely do not hate G.I. Joe. A lot of people are like, oh, he's he's a bitter ex-employee. Well, yeah. If you do your heart <laughs> and soul to a company and, and, and sold hundreds of millions of dollars of product and love that company and made life changes to go work for one company and yep. they turn your, their back on you, of course you're going to be bitter about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it all started. There was this line that came out right before I started my Kickstarter. And it was this, this company that was doing a second Kickstarter before their first Kickstarter funded. And I was very vocal and I said, do not back this because they can't pay for the first Kickstarter. So they're doing the second one to supplement it so that they could pay for the first one. And people lost it on me. They were like, who is he to say this? Blah, blah, blah. Fast forward to, to like two years later, that guy stole all that money. He never delivered Ooh. on the first Kickstarter. He never delivered on the second Kickstarter. And he disappeared with hundreds of thousands of dollars of people's money. Now I'm here three years later. 
87 items out, successful company, and who's right? But will you see them on that forum saying, hey, remember when we got mad at him because he said that? Well, actually, he was right about that. No, 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 no. They'll find something new to get mad at me about. And yeah, yeah. it's just funny. It's funny. It's like, listen, again, even if you don't like the line, great. But again, it's just like uh, you're, you're wasting time. And at the end of the day, it's just funny. It's funny like the amount of, of rent-free space that I have in other grown men's heads is amazing i'll never i'll never not have a place to live because i could always go to one of these heads and live there it's just it's it's really funny and you can't listen every line every company is always going to have their haters you know um i got a bunch of them and i love them i i i want to say i want to thank them i think they're great you know why because they watch our show they watch a three poa and they watch it because they're hanging on every word I say because they want to get on their form. Like, he said this. But you know what's funny is they're watching it and it counts for, as views for us and views are money. So I want to yes. thank them. Yes. The ones that, that hate hate me and they come and they, they come to the booth and spend $400 on product, I think it's great. So I love the haters and trolls that I have. I couldn't have done it without you guys. I love you guys so much. We'd like to thank all our hate viewers right now, too. <laughs> well, I can't wait. I can't wait to see the comments. They're like, of course, Bobby Bell is teaming up with Clownfish TV. Oh, yeah. It's like you a should, circus over there. You should have seen what we were getting on our show yesterday about talking about the HasLab thing. It's like, listen, if you if you try to come out and it's like, listen, I could say something looks awesome. But then if I no. say like the price and the offering are wrong and I give like detailed information on why it's wrong like he's just a hater it's like oh no i'm and i never tell anyone not to buy something like Mm -hmm. the only time i said don't buy something is is that one guy's kickstarter but listen if you like a giant man has lab definitely buy it i've spent i spent twelve hundred dollars on a cardboard playset at powercon i'm not one to talk (laughs) to anyone about not buying something but i want to make sure that I inform the customer. I want you to be an informed customer. I want you to know the information. And, you know, I think, you know, our show kind of helped end the engine engine of, of greed. And, you know, that's kind of a feather in our cap for that. But again, that was something where the fans got inside information on why this is bad, how to compare it to another item that Hasbro put out to, so that they were educated on, yeah, that's not a good value. And there were some right. people like, listen, I love it. I'm buying it. I know it's overpriced, but I'm buying it. Okay. That's, that's cool, man. You're a collector. You are entitled yeah. to do that. But me as a, as a, as a company owner who, who does consumer products, it is my responsibility to inform the customers on what is a good value or not. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's really cool because a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, company owners, uh, you know, don't, don't really care. They just want the money, right? I mean, they'll yep. take your money. Uh, you know, so uh, to actually get an education in the process is is pretty interesting. I think I think uh, you know um, the internet in general has made things a lot more transparent for consumers, uh, which I think can be a double edged sword sometimes mm-hmm. because then every every question gets or every every decision gets questioned rather, and uh, you know it's like, well, no, this is just kind of the way it works. It's like, no, we don't understand. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly why you're you're acting up the way you're at. Cause you know, let's tell you, we're going to tell you how it actually works. And we, we've tried telling people, you know, pulling the curtain back on things and, and uh, people are like, no, you're just making it up. And it's like, no, we're, we're not literally you can go <laughs> ask anybody who does this. Uh, well, somebody on Reddit said, yeah, they don't count They're Yeah. They're on Reddit. <laughs> they don't really count. But uh, um, no, I was actually really excited. Uh, Bobby, I went to your page yesterday and you guys are doing a uh, Jason, Jason David Frank action figure is that correct? Yeah, um, very excited. Very. Now excited. Is that is that part of Action Force or is he sort of a no? Separate? So um, it all came about because so we have an Action Force movie in the works, mm-hmm. and uh, our producer on the movie is uh, friends with this one director who is putting out this movie called Legend of the White Dragon, and okay. it was. Jason David Frank's last movie that he filmed before he died. Yeah. And it's, it's a very like power Rangers esque type movie. And it's Mm -hmm. like, he knows his genre. He loved that genre, but he wanted to do something that wasn't power Rangers, but 
you know, gave back to his Power Ranger fans. And we all know he's the most po popular Power Ranger. Yep. He was super well known. Great with the fans. Always did conventions and signings mm -hmm. and things like that. Love those fans. And our producer talking to that director, he said, hey, my guy, we're doing Action Force. He's got a toy line. And the guy's like, oh, I want to do, you know, Legend of the White Dragon figures. We got hooked up. And I said, I would absolutely love to do figures. And especially if it's Jason's last figure, yeah. like to be able to, to honor him in that way. It was, it mean everything to me. So, yeah, we started right away working. The movie is coming out in November. Go check out the trailer. The trailer's like awesome. It's 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 a really good trailer. I know they did uh you know really a, a great panel at, at San Diego Comic Con where they they debuted the trailer. And yeah, that thing I'm pretty sure the movie's coming out in November. Our figure is gonna be going up for pre-order uh later this month, and it will probably deliver sometime in January or February. We're just ironing out those details, but it will be a two-pack of Jason's character, who is the hero character called uh, White Dragon, and then the villain, which is Dragon Prime. So it's it's a two, a, a two pack of you know you get both figures, so it's a battle right out of there. And um, you know that's that's the initial item that we're doing. We're gonna see how that 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 goes. Maybe we'll do more Legends of the White Dragon figures. Uh, you know if everything goes well. But I'm so excited for this to be our first IP, like mm -hmm. someone else's IP that mm -hmm. we're bringing in to do. And to be able to do that, and I know like the the Jason David Frank fans and the Power Ranger fans yeah. are so excited about this. I get messages every day like, when are these coming out? I can't wait to see them. So, you know, we're looking forward to opening up the pre-orders later this month just because we know that it's going to be such a successful item. Um, you know, the figures are, are going to look awesome. We already went to tooling with them. So, again, it's something that's not going to be crowdfunded. We're just going to make this item because I believe in this item. I believe in that fan base. And, uh, yeah, it, I'm, I, I'm so excited about it. That's that's awesome. Yeah, that was – God, that was heartbreaking. It yeah. was heartbreaking. I watched yeah. – uh, uh, you know, obviously, I was too old to watch Power Rangers myself, but I used to watch <laughs> with my little brothers, and, and Tommy was, you know, a huge part of their mm -hmm. childhoods. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it, it, it really – I mean, it – I met him once or twice, I think, at different conventions. Uh, very nice guy. Uh, always, like you said, with the fans, he was fantastic. I mean, he was, he always had a smile. He was always upbeat. He was always positive. And, uh, you know, it was that was a huge blow to fandom. And, and to, yeah. you know, be able to work on something like that, I think, is, is fantastic for sure. So um, now are you, you know, you mentioned uh, licensed toys are you are you going to go after other licenses now or are you just going to stick with with action force or I, I definitely want to um we we landed a big license um earlier this year and the company uh they uh defaulted on the agreement so we we got out of that agreement because we realized that it was going to be bad news uh which sucked because it was a really big license mm -hmm. but the way they were running things behind the scenes, I, I was like, I want no part of this. Mm. Um, but I'm always looking for something like Action Force will always be our flagship line, always be my baby. And I always put, you know, my my most effort into into Action Force because it's so important to this company. But I want to bring other brands in and I'm always looking for something. And it's weird because we're in a time right now where companies are swallowing up these old properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to just say, hey, there's this this old 80s property that had one season of a cartoon and the <laughs> toy line sucked and it didn't sell well and the cartoon didn't get re renewed, but it's niche and it's it's nostalgic. So let's let's do it. I think there's too much of that. You know, yeah, there are a yeah. lot of these 80s lines or 90s lines that are coming out and you're like, why are you investing tooling into that line? Like, are you going to make that money back? I hope you're going to make that money back. <laughs> Um, but I can tell you right now, like I wouldn't be getting some of these lines. I've been presented with some lines. I'm like, Nope, I don't want that one. Yeah. Um, there's a few I would take. Um, but as of right now, it's like everyone's eating at all, all the eighties, nineties properties up. So I, I'm not really like looking for that. I'm looking at what's, what's coming out in new movies, new video game spaces. You know, I'm also looking at what, what could be a, you know, a movie line or a TV line or something like that, that is, you know, five to 10 years old, but still has this huge fan following mm -hmm. that 
maybe people haven't gotten proper figures for to do that you know um there there but, is a line there there is a line you could do and okay. this is this is just because uh, myself and Rage Holic are big fans of this but the shadow the shadow has not okay. had a good line of toys since Kenner did them in the 90s oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. listen don't you you're like tugging at my heartstrings here cuz <laughs> i have or, or the I, or, or the phantom uh, the ghost who walks or mm. lothar or anything from king features yeah, King Feature I love, stuff is, I yeah. love the shadow. Love it. I, I have a custom, I don't really do customs, but I wanted a shadow figure. So I made a, a custom Mezco shadow figure. Mm -hmm. Now Mezco's doing a shadow figure, which I pre order because theirs is going to be better than mine. Yep. But I'm Did just too. like, <laughs> oh, I would love to do the shadow. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to do a shadow Dick Tracy crossover, but I want to mm -hmm. do a comic series with it. I want to do the figures with it. Um, but I, and I think Dick Tracy and the Shadow are close to be coming up for public domain eventually within the next 10 years. Yes, within 10 um, years, yeah. But like, yeah, the Shadow is one of those things where it's awesome, but it's like, how big is that fan base? You know? <laughs> it's just like a one off figure, really. A, I, yeah, you couldn't do, yeah. I mean, unless you wanted to do a vehicle and you did a cab and you did Mo, yeah. most, uh, uh, Mo, what's his name with it and, and do some of those those fig those characters that nobody knows from the old radio show but yeah. that's such a limited base but the shadow himself is just kind of a one-off figure you could probably do and and have a good line with it but yeah i could see not wanting to spend the money just for a one-off figure i know <laughs> i know it's tough and it's like i also i mezco is one of my favorite companies out there mm -hmm. um i know they have their their shortcomings too but i've always said publicly that I love their product. I think it, it's so cool what they're doing. Um, yeah, there's some issues, 89 Batman, but a lot of it is so great. And they're doing the shadow. So it's kind of like, well, I don't want to step on their toes. I want them to do the best version of the shadow. So it's mm -hmm. like, I'd hate to like be like, no, I could do my own version and have it not be as good as their version. So, you know, I'm going to wait and see how their version comes out. Mm -hmm. you know, say, it's the way I feel about the Rocketeer also, you know? Yeah. We haven't gotten the best six inch rockets here yet. Diamond did one. Uh, some other company did one. Another company is doing one soon. He comes with a, t in a two pack with Betty, but I think it's like $120. It's, Whoa. A, it's insanely Migo. priced. Whoa. Migo did one. We have that yep. one, I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, no one's done the best version yet. Mm -hmm. the Diamond yeah. one was close, but it could have been better. Mm -hmm. Well, Sky Captain. Do a Sky Captain figure <laughs> with the with the plane, or do the robot, or something. That'd be pretty cool. I love I love Sky Captain. There's not enough love for Sky. See, that's the problem. You never sell any because people are like, oh, I vaguely remember that movie, right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah I was uh, looking at my you know my DVDs that are covered with dust because nobody watches DVDs anymore. And I was looking and I was like trying to go down the line saying, would I do figures for that movie? Would I do figures for that movie? And you know, like for instance, look at like Lord of the Rings. My mm -hmm. all-time favorite series of movies. It holds up. It's amazing. I still get chills when I watch the movies now. The Toy Biz line, while not good at first, became amazing at the end. The Sauron was great. Sauron was great. But then you're like, I see that Diamond Select was doing Lord of the Rings a couple years ago. And I got so excited because I'm like, yes. Because some of the Toy Biz figures, we want to update that that articulation. Mm. We want a modern day Lord of the Rings figure, and I was like, "This is this is great because you're not going to screw up a modern day figure. Now you're going to you put your best foot forward." And I was really disappointed with the line that came out. <laughs> I was like, "They dropped the ball." Now, granted, Sauron, the build a figure Sauron, is amazing, but like Aragorn's my favorite, and his figure's not great. That granted, they're still doing them, so I'm I'm okay with it because they're going to get better. But they're not doing it to the depth that Toy Biz did it. And I get right. it. Tooling's more expensive. But to me, it's like if you have a chance to do a modern take on it, like to do the best version you can do, you got to make that the best version. But now it's like, say their line fails. I'm not going to go get the Lord of the Rings license and do another line of six inch Lord of the Rings. You know, so you got to watch if someone gets a license and they screw it up. You really don't want to get that because it's kind of tainted in that in that way. Yeah, um, there's a company that's doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle figures that's not Playmates, and they're kind of terrible. I've got a few of them back there. I mean, they're they're just cheap. Yeah. It's great that you're like getting some that are in different variations, but they're just so cheap. Yeah. And I have, and I think that same company is also doing a Lord of the Rings line as well. Ah, uh, 
And okay. yeah, but if you wanted to do Lord of the Rings, I mean, I would say do the Ralph Bakshi version. <laughs> That'd be cool. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, I'd love to do Clash of the Titans. Oh, I love, God. listen, I have that whole series. I have the Kraken, mm-hmm. I have all of them. But it's like, who really cares? You know, yeah, who cares I mean, about Clash of the yeah. Titans? I do, and I'm sure you guys do, but I, you know, not enough to sell the amount yeah, of you like, Here's your Jason and the Argonauts line, and you'd probably yeah. sell like 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you want to, it's tough, man. It's tough to, to decide on a, on a license. You got to make mm-hmm. sure that it's really, really compelling and it, it has a big fan base. And, you know, these people are going to get behind a toy line to give it right. some longevity. Right. Cause I don't want to do just one, a, a one-off thing. I want, I want to do something where I can say like, that was the definitive version of that, of that IP. You know, people are going to start hitting you up to do mechs now, next. Just, hmm. I, mean, I can, I can see that being a 200 plus line with the amount of articulation and all that. But I, I, I would like to see you do, do like a mech, like a 12 inch tall or, or 16 inch tall mech for your, for your action force figures to go in. Hmm. Maybe like, like exo suits, like that, that old line. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny is I'll I'll say this because you know it's nothing to hide, but I love Exo Squad. It's one of my favorite 90s lines. Mm-hmm. Love the toy line. The toy line was so ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. I wanted that license. And I, I reached out to the to the owner of it, the guy who created it, and I said, Hey, this is what I do. I would love to license it. Because one, I wanted to do versions of the old stuff mm-hmm. but also i wanted to bring exo squad into a new realm and make it part of action force like a sub team and modernize it and he supposedly he's been working on a reboot for like the last five years and he was like two years ago he's like yeah you know we're gonna wait to see what happens with the reboot but we'll be in touch and then i reached out to him recently and i'm like hey what's going on He's like, yeah, we're still working on the reboot, so we're not doing anything until that happens. We're just like, listen, if I get to do it, great. If not, you know, like, you have my number. Let me know, you know. But, you know, we'll see. But it could be great. It could be great. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's definitely a, a risky thing to do, doing mech suits. Um, mm-hmm. Could be something I'm already looking into for Action Force. You know, even if it's not Exo Squad to do, you know, mechs. Everyone wants mechs. You know, Mezco mm-hmm. came out yeah. with their mech, and people – Fell in love with it. That tooling's just got to be a bitch to do. Oh yeah. Unless you're just going to do one and and that's it, and just vary vary with colors. But if you're going to try to do a whole line, I could just I can't imagine the the amount of capital it would take to do that. Oh yeah. Tooling. You got to find a way to make it modular to the point where you have mm-hmm. one core like body, and then mm-hmm. you can change the arms on it and put different attachments on. So you could change the silhouettes around greatly, but there's that one core mm-hmm. cockpit in a way. <clears throat> well there's there's your answer mike yeah <laughs> maybe sometime in the future i might see what i want <laughs> sometime yeah. in the future so i uh, tell you what bobby uh we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up and i really really appreciate you coming on i want you to give your final sales pitch to people that have never maybe uh never even looked at your line before where can they find your stuff uh where should they start you've got what 87 87 figures 87 Where? items, not, you know, a lot of them are sold out now, but we have so much coming down the pipe. Like, um, we have, uh, well, first, listen, guys, if you want a great six inch scale military line, if military is not your thing and you just want to, uh, uh, and if you, you just love great toys, you can get this line also. But if you're a military fan, this line is for you. It's called Action Force. Go to valiverse.com, and that's where we have all the items that we have in stock unavailable um we have uh you know a lot of the previous series are sold out because this stuff flies out out of our warehouse but we have a whole bunch of new stuff coming we have our series 3.1 which will be here at the end of september we have series four which is our new lower priced items that's a huge line that's coming out in november we have our Legends of the White Dragon figures coming. Yes. We have our Vanguard, which is our vehicle coming up for pre-order soon. So go to Valiverse.com. You can sign up for the newsletter there so you stay up to date with everything, uh, you know, all the news and stuff. Also, make sure you're following our social media accounts, Facebook and Instagram. It's Valiverse everywhere. And we put all, you know, posts up letting people know when stuff is coming. So if 
you're a fan of the line, thank you for supporting it. If you're new to the line, more stuff is coming. So we also reissue a lot of stuff that is sold out. So, uh, you know, we try to make stuff available down the road, but be sure to follow Valvers everywhere. And uh, if you want a great toy line, that is very customer first. Action Force is your line. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bobby, for coming on tonight. Uh, thank you, Mike, for coming on. It's been a great chat. Hopefully we'll have you back on again. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Thank you guys, thank you guys so much. It's been a, an honor to, to come on your show. Fantastic. Yeah, same here. Same here. All right, guys. So uh, give us a sub wherever you found this podcast, whether it's on YouTube, uh, Rumble, uh, Spotify, Amazon, wherever, wherever it is. It's all over the place. We're all over the place. Uh, take care.